Let's open in prayer. Father, we want to see you as you are, high and lifted up, seated on the throne. Father, we're grateful that we have a God such as you that's mighty and strong and powerful and good who really cares for us. And with all of your love, Lord, we want to beseech you for all those that are suffering right now with the fire that's going on, the, those who are being evacuated, those who are suffering loss because of this, um, <coughs> all those fighting the fire and involved in, you know, just trying to make this um, fire be put out, um, keeping peace and so forth. We're asking that you'd strengthen them, give them wisdom, and Lord, that you just have your hand upon every life, that life would be spared, we pray. And that fear, the fear that is hitting many's hearts would, would just turn their eye to you, Lord. It's hard to watch devastation and, and um, sometimes have faith. But we pray, Lord, for a miracle in hearts and lives that that it would not turn them away from you, but it would turn them to you. And that you'd send your witnesses, your, your Christians, your people, to do great ministry among those that are hurting right now. We just beg your help, Lord, over that circumstance. And we want to pray for tonight, Lord. I thank you for each and every woman that's here. They're here to seek you, Lord. They're here to know you. And so I just pray your Holy Spirit would make himself known Reveal who you are to us, Lord, as we dig into your scripture. Show us your heart. Show us your nature. Show us, Lord, who you are. And show us how we should walk and follow after you. I pray that you take hold of my mouth, Lord, my thoughts, my mind, my heart, every part of me. And uh, just for your glory, keep my flesh out of the way. And I just pray for ability to teach and uh, for the words to just flow out of my mouth. And... Uh, we trust, Lord, that you're here because you've made a promise that when two or three gather in your name, there you are in the midst. We know you're here, and we bless you for that. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, will you turn to Luke chapter 12? Luke chapter 12. Remember to silence your cell phones. We really appreciate that if you would silence them for the videotape. Luke chapter 12, and then... We're going to begin in verse 13. All right, Luke chapter 12, and we're going to jump right in to verse, verse 13, teaching on the parable of the rich fool. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now Jesus was speaking to a massive crowd. It was so massive that people were actually being trampled underfoot as they pressed in to hear him. It reminds me of like the old rock concerts where just so many people, they're tr just pushing and pushing and actually injuring each other out of all of their excitement. And this crowd was a real mixed batch of people. There were Gentiles and there were Jews. Uh, there were followers of Christ and there were antagonists in the crowd. There were religious leaders and there were unbelievers. But all of them followed Jesus with great interest. They wanted to hear what he had to say. Be he had a different word and a different voice. And I don't mean a voice like this, but I mean his philosophies that he was teaching were different than they had ever heard before. And so thousands of people were coming to hear him. So scripture, it tells us, says concerning Jesus, never has a man spoken like this. He stood out from many who came forward to speak and preach. And yet still many rejected him. Why? Because scripture also indicates that men had said of his teachings, this is a tough teaching, too tough to swallow. His message on co covetousness is no different. <laughs> it is not an easy word to swallow for many. Now Jesus always made it clear that his kingdom was different than the kingdom of this world. He said that, uh, made it clear that living um, a life for him would cost, it would be costly to us. Um, he maintained different ethics than the world and he gives us a different worldview. 
isn't it true that we see the world and life entirely differently than the rest of the world? And so Jesus came with a very different message. And he called people who would follow him to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him. It was costly, a costly message. In the parable of the rich fool, Jesus underlines and underscores these realities. So this man from the crowd, he says to him, Jesus, tell me, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And I can just imagine him pushing in, trying to wedge his way through the people, getting up close enough that his voice could be heard by Jesus, squeezing through, telling him, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And many interpret this passage right here, this, this sentence, to mean that, that this was the younger brother of a father who was deceased. And he had an older brother. And in the law at that time, um, within the Jews, the older brother would receive two-thirds of his father's inheritance. If there was two sons, the younger brother would receive one-third. And so this man was not just saying, arbitrate between me and my brother, but he was saying, tell my brother to give me half of the inheritance. Now, as lawyers, rabbis usually were the authorities in such cases. They were usually the judges who would arbitrate disputes um, among men, uh, this, you know, kind of things that would go along this nature. That was their role to play. Um, but this man wanted Jesus to use his authority to his best interest, bringing um, Jesus into this dispute. So we aren't given the entirety of the circumstances, are we? We don't understand why this is happening, where the injustice might be. Was his brother withholding the fair amount from um, him? Or was he being legally or immorally wrong? Or did this man make a claim that he had no right to? Was he just full of greed? We don't know. Jesus doesn't say specifically um, there are no additional facts given because Jesus didn't see it as crucial to this um, story, um, and neither did the Holy Spirit, or he would have had the, the man, the author that penned this story, uh, put it in. He put all the things that he wanted us to know in the scripture. So Jesus turns to him in verse 14, and he speaks to him pointedly. He said, man, who made me judge or an arbitrator over you? Now, understand that Jesus wasn't, um, you know, unconcerned about injustice. Of course, Jesus cared about injustice. In any person's life, he cared deeply about that. But there were secular judges enough and judges within um, the Jewish community enough to arbitrate a feud between two brothers. Jesus had a higher purpose for being in the world among men, didn't he? A much higher purpose. And Jesus, um, you know, this man himself didn't recognize that that was Christ's purpose. Jesus came with a different agenda rather um, than to get in the middle of these things. He came to die and to rise again from the dead and conquer sin and death. And this man, he wasn't a true seeker. He didn't see who Jesus really was. And we, we can see when he called him teacher, that he devalued who he really was. And so Jesus' kingdom was not of this world. And Jesus saw through this man's complaint very clearly. He saw straight to his heart. Jesus knew his thoughts, and he actually exposed his ulterior motive through the, the parable that we're going to study. New Testament scripture um, says that Jesus knew the hearts of men, and he knew their thoughts. Scripture tells us that he knew in his spirit the reasoning of men, what was going on and how they were thinking through things. And scripture says that he perceived men's thoughts, which means to know accurately and know well. Now understand that Jesus was fully God and fully man. And this, we see the omniscience of God through this, that Jesus always remained God. And he understood what was really going on in the motives of this man's heart. So from there, Jesus turns from the man and he turns to the crowd and he begins to minister truth to the crowd, using the heart issues of this man as a springboard to uh, his teaching. So verse 15, he begins... 
And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Take heed and beware, which means watch out and guard yourselves. The idea behind this is that we are all under attack from covetousness, and we must protect ourselves from it. It's a weak point for us as humans to be covetous, and so we need to have a guard up about it. Covetousness, let me give you a few biblical definitions for covetousness. These are right out of the Greek. The desire to have something for oneself, a craving, or a passionate desire. I, I, I like this definition because it, it, you could see how it has different levels, right? You could just have a desire, but then you could have a craving, and then you could have a passion, right? It, it, it could be any one of those levels um, and yet still be covetousness. Two, the state of desiring to have more than one's due. I've earned this. It's come to me. It belongs to me. But this is I want more than is due to me. Three, a strong desire to acquire more and more. And I added better and better, because it's true, material possessions, or to possess more things than other people do. And you can see in covetousness, there's that sense of competition, you know, wanting to one-up and do better and compete and be equal or more than others. Um, and all of that is ir irrespective of need. It has nothing to do with the need that I have. It's the more and more that I want and the better and better that I want. The closest synonym in our English language to covetousness is greed, and a modern term would be materialism. Covetousness was addressed in the commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 17, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And by neighbor, it just means anybody else. Do not covet what is theirs. Do not want it, long for it, passionately desire it for yourself. Now, this week I received a humorous message from one of my group leaders, one of my morning group leaders. Her name is Ara. Yes, it is on video. <laughs> because she's hilarious. She messaged me this me week and said, Vanita, I, I'm doing the homework and I have to confess something to you. I'm like, okay, go ahead, have at it. I don't know what she's getting at whatsoever. And she said, Vanita, I have to let you know that I've been coveting your ox and your donkey. <laughs> it's so funny that I told you to turn your phones off, but I didn't turn mine off. Oh my gosh, I was dying. And I would stop it, stop it right now. <laughs> So I told her, hey, you ought to you ought to modernize that. Like and I haven't heard and she did. I don't know what she did, but I thought I ought to modernize that <laughs> and put that right into my study. So some of those are very obvious, but I'm gonna add a modernize a few of them. You shall not covet your neighbor's male servant, their gardener, their mechanic, their contractor, or their handyman. <laughs> you shall not covet your neighbor's female servant, their washing machine or dryer. Their dishwasher, I was at a friend's house and they got a new dishwasher and it was absolutely silent. I've never not heard a dishwasher better than that. It was nice. <laughs> Do not covet their housekeeper or their use of Amazon Fresh Delivery. <laughs> you shall not covet your neighbor's ox their lawnmower, their trailer, or anything else they're using around the house to get the job done. And you shall not covet your neighbor's donkey, their car, their jet ski, their ATV, or their motorcycle. So we shall not covet what our neighbors have. The book of Proverbs views greed as a dividing line between the righteous and the evil. It says in Proverbs 21, 26, all day long he craves for more, but the righteous give without sparing. The evil person craves more and more. The righteous gives without sparing. Greed is driven with the desire for more, better, and sometimes in a state of competition with others, it's always seeking to satisfy itself. Whether its goal is a momentary happiness 
or it's a lifetime filled with extravagance and indulgence. Greed is short-sighted. You know, we live in such a, an age where it's so easy to order something online and get a package delivered to our doorstep or in our mailbox, and it feels like Christmas all year. <laughs> It's so exciting to, you know, have that item show up at the door. And all we have to do is look through a magazine or go online. And, I mean, we're just getting messages, you know, bombarded, the television, about get this and buy that and here's the latest and you've got to have it and it's an improvement than anything you've ever had before. Get rid of the old one. i got to move into that new thing, right? And we're getting bombarded with these messages all the time. And it's instant gratification, that we're looking for because there's this moment this little like happy moment of i ordered it, it's on its way checking it checking it you know of tracking that package where is it now it's just something about it that is exciting am i right we love it we love it i mean let's think about it we made up christmas so that we could buy everything we've been wanting for a while <laughs> and say uh, a little prayer to jesus and read the manger story and bam we got christmas you know let's be honest we take advantage of that that covets us a lot of times it takes over but it's it's short-sighted because its emphasis is on the temporal covetousness is about here and now and what I can get to please me and satisfy me. Um, but it has no thought to the eternal and what matters, what will be carried into our life with Christ later on. Therefore, um, covetousness becomes a bondage because it, it, its desire overtakes us. We give our flesh permission to experience desire out of control. It becomes an idol and an altar for fleeting pleasures. The Apostle Paul repeatedly condemned greed. He exhorted the Colossians, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. We read those lists of sins like, that is disgusting. <laughs> no one should practice those things. But greed is right in there with them. To the church of Ephesus, Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, 3, but among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. To the Ephesian elders, he wrote of himself, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. And he wrote that in Acts uh, 20, verse 33. Paul did ministry for free. He worked as a tent maker. He had less than anyone. <laughs> he was impoverished, basically. And yet he said, you have all this. I don't cover, I'm not covering, coveting anything that you have. I'm not doing ministry saying, bless me, let me gain from you in any way. And so he, his life was an example of a man free of greed. So Ecclesiastes 5.10 makes it clear. Whoever loves money never has enough money. Isn't that true? Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. It's vanity. It's a vain way to live your life. In other words, the love of stuff and the desire to acquire more is worthless, empty, shallow, and a fruitless way to live your life. Again, let's turn to Luke 12, 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. To quote Warren Wearsby, covetousness is an unquenchable thirst for getting more and more of something we think we need in order to be truly satisfied. It may be a thirst for money or the things that money can buy. Uh, it may even be a thirst for position and power. Jesus made it clear that true life does not depend on an abundance of possessions. And didn't Jesus demonstrate this with his very own life on earth? In his own lifetime, Jesus was landless, he was homeless, and he was penniless. He wasn't here to acquire. 
He wasn't here to amass wealth. With all those followers, he left this earth penniless because that's what his, he didn't make his life about that. And he was our highest example. When his disciples urged him to, to really to, to reach out and try to take power in Rome, to take a political position, because the Jews always thought that the Messiah was going to come and was going to stomp Rome down, and really that, that they, would take, they would take over. And that was their desire. That was never God's plan at all. He's a spiritual king, not an earthly king. And so when they, they were like, are you going to do it? Is this our time? He refused such notions altogether. He was greedy for none of the temporal, <laughs> earthly things that they thought he might be. And he forsook all of his comforts of heaven to bring us spiritual wealth. That's what mattered, spiritual wealth. An abundant life is not made of possessions, the scripture is teaching us. It's made of relationship, relationship with the Lord our God. Many false teachers hold up wealth and promises to be received to into your life if you're full of faith. If you will just believe God is promising that you will have wealth. And they lure people into this by accessing their greed. Because we are greedy and we love that kind of gospel. It's easy to want those things. And so they take advantage of that. And they promise, if in your faith you will sow seeds to them or sow seeds of money into their ministry, you will reap a harvest. With, if you sow one seed, your $1,000, your $100, whatever it is, you are going to reap $10,000. You know, And this is the promises that they make people. And the crazy thing is, is it, it actually does happen. People will sow that seed and they will get money back. By God's good grace, he blesses people. But that doesn't make it a doctrine that's true. It's not truth. These men are liars. These men and women that teach that, they are liars. They are using people to market, you know, market this whole kind of gospel in order to make themselves healthy. And it has nothing to do with producing fruit of the kingdom. These ministers get richer and richer. And their judgment, according to scripture, will be severe. I think that's important when we're thinking about, um, you know, covetousness. That it even intrudes into the faith. And to be aware of that. Jesus... He wants to continue to build on this teaching of covetousness. And so now he inserts the parable, the parable of the rich fool. So let's look at verse 16 and move on. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for, your, for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus is going to reveal why this man is a fool. And as I looked through this, I found eight missteps eight missteps of this rich fool. Um, and I want to offer scriptural truth that invalidates his thinking, invalidates his motives, and invalidates his plans. So let's allow these truths to be a warning to our own lives. And let's allow the Holy Spirit to um, speak to us in order to correct us if we are in any missteps right now. So number one, the ground of a certain man yielded plentifully. The ground was good and the ground was good because god is good god providentially provides for his people in psalm 145 15 it says the eyes of all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season and you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing the fact that the ground was good was because god is good and he made his ground excellent. Gill says, God has a general care over the whole world and all the parts of it. For as the earth is his and the fullness thereof, his providential care reaches everywhere. God was the reason that his ground was so good. 
So that first point is the ground, of that, uh, the ground was good because of God's providential care. Two, he gave no thanks. He showed no gratitude. Deuteronomy 8.10 says, When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. No gratitude, no thankfulness, never lifting his head toward God and giving praise. Three, he thought within himself. He thought within himself. Rather than seeking the Lord about what he might do with all of his abundance and, and really involving the Lord, inviting him into making future plans, he thought within himself. And you know when you think within yourself that you are shutting God out? We have to think. He gave us brains. But we, we ask God to be the head of that process, right? We ask him to be the leader of our lives. And this man just thought within himself because he was the leader of his life. Psalm 9, verse 10 says, And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Let that encourage you. You haven't forsaken those who seek you. Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding as this man was doing. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. You know that if you fear God, you will seek him and he will lead you in paths of righteousness that have no evil involved in them. If you do not seek the Lord, like him, thinking within yourself, evil is around the corner because you're about to error. So then he said, I will do this. He begins to devise a plan without the Lord. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. We need his involvement in our plans. Isaiah 30 verse 1 says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel but not of me, who devise plans but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Do not devise a plan on your own. And then five, I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up. And he's talking to himself about the brilliant job he did. Soul, you are amazing. Look what you've done for yourself. Look what you've accomplished. Look at, look at the vastness of your abundance. And this man was filled with pride. And he took credit for what God had blessed him with. Proverbs 16.8 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And 1 Chronicles 29, 12 and 13 says, Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. That is the prayer of the humble who literally honors God, trusts God, makes a plan in the Lord, understands that it's his hand of blessing and gives him the praise. Six, we have many good lay, you have many goods laid up, he said to his soul. He relies on the many stores that he has now laid up. I'm going to expand my barns. I'm storing it all up. I have everything I need, and I've taken well care of myself. But he relied, he's relying on them to be there instead of relying on God. Isaiah 31 uh, 1 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, which is, is a representative of the world, that go to the world for help, who rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong. Notice, we, we, you know, we could use our own terms for this, but they're trusting in the, the, the world strength and what the world would offer them to get through their lives. But who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord? Woe to those that do not seek the Lord. So he was trusting in everything that he feels he attained to maintain his life. We need to trust in the Lord. And then he said, take your ease. In his abundance, he felt no obligation to help others. I'm, I'm set now. I can take my ease. But what about others? He never looked beyond himself. 
Isaiah 58.10 says, If you give someone your, of your own food to feed those who are hungry and to satisfy the needs of those who are humble, then your light will rise in the dark and your darkness will become as bright as the noonday. When God has blessed you and you have excess, God's calling you to give to others. And as you do that, you're shining brightly for the Lord in a world who needs to see what he's like. And then he says, the last one, eat, drink, and be merry. Wasted energies, wasted provisions, wasted opportunities, a wasted life. You know, Solomon had attained greatness in his lifetime. He was great in position. He became the king. He was great in his wealth. He was extremely wealthy. And in fact, he was a celebrity. He was well known around the world at that time for his wisdom. And people would come to sit at his feet and, and gain wisdom from him. He was very well known. God had given Solomon this beautiful gift of wisdom, but in his flesh, despite all the wisdom that God had given him, he wanted to experience all that life had offered. And so he dove deep into the deep end of, uh, of a sensual and indulgent life. Just a crazy indulgent lifestyle in, in order to discover that it was all vanity, meaningless, worthlessness. He wrote in Ecclesiastes 2.1, I thought to myself, come now, I will try self-indulgent pleasure to see if it is worthwhile. But I also found that it was meaningless. So those were his eight missteps. I'm sure there's more in there. Let's read verses 20 and 21 now. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will, then who, whose will those things be by which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So Today, your life will be required of you. In other words, this is the day that you are going to be in judgment. You're dying. And you have amassed all of this. Who's it even going to be? Who's, who's going to take ownership of it all? And you've laid, no, you're not rich toward God. You've made all your treasure here on earth. This man had spent a lot of time considering what, how he was going to enjoy his material possessions and his wealth, but he never considered the state of his soul, the condition of his soul, what would happen after he died. He was thinking of his future here on earth, but he was never thinking beyond that. No consideration of eternity. And we all get so immersed into this life, it's easy to forget that this is a place we're just passing through. So all the possessions he had gained, he had really gained nothing. Because the fact is, you can't take it with you, right? Mark 8, 36 says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? It is vanity. So whose will these things be to which you have provided? He'll never know because he won't be around to know. He couldn't take it with him. Verse 21 says, So he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. That's, that's the heart of someone who's not lived with eternity in mind. Um, I will quote Warren Wearsby here. He said, What does it mean to live rich toward God? It means to acknowledge gratefully that everything we have comes from God and then make an effort to use what he has given us for the good of others and the glory of God. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth will and rust will destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. As we live for eternity, as we live a life that's purposefully like I'm headed toward heaven, so how I live, I want to be the rewards to go forward that way. I want the life I live to please God. Um, that's when you're banking in heaven. But a person like this rich fool, he, he lived for this world and he banked for this world. and <laughs> He comes up empty in the end. Now, how can you store up treasures in heaven and how can you be rich toward God? How can we turn around uh, the rich man's missteps into righteous steps in our own life? I'm going to give you a list of, of some things that you can do and just talk about it. First, 
Put your, check, your greed in check. Put your greed in check. Put your greed in check. When you get a sudden urgent desire, or, or maybe you've had a lingering one for a good long time, pray about it. Bring it before God and be real with him. And ask him, is this from you? Is this your will for me? Ask the Holy Spirit to sort out your motives. If, if you come up and to realizing it was just impure, it was a desire, a greedy desire that's not God's will, confess that. Ask for forgiveness. Then ask for guidance about what to do if that di- desire still remains within you. Many times, he's going to simply say, wait. Don't take action on that desire right now. And you know what's amazing is when we pray and we wait, so often we realize, man, I'm so glad I didn't jump on that. What a waste that would have been. What a mistake. What a complication it would have added to my life had I done it. You know? And so waiting is so wise because waiting often gives us time to really see if it's important or not. And then he may say to you, go ahead. Go ahead and move forward with it. But now maybe you'll do it with a purified heart. Maybe your motives will be made right so that when you're doing it, it can please the Lord. And that matters, that our motives matter to God. So have him check your motives. He may say, drop it like a hot potato, lady. And then we want to humbly submit to that. We want to obey. Don't do it. Just, just put it aside and know that God has something better for you. Don't let your flesh rule over you because that's what covetousness, it's your flesh out of control, wanting what it wants, believing a lie that it will satisfy you or make you complete or whole, uh, make you feel better about yourself, and it's a lie. I have recently gone through this exact experience. Um, You know, my husband and I, as we're looking toward moving to Idaho, um, we've been looking at homes. And so my husband put on my computer some um, agencies uh, that show us homes. They send it to us on a regular basis, all these homes. And then he went further and put apps on my phone because he wanted me to be kind of looking around and checking it out and seeing what's out there. And as I did, and I would talk to my husband, and we'd look it together. Sometimes we look on our own. Um, he would tell me, okay, this is what I think we're going to be able to afford with our house and so forth. I got extremely bummed because I was looking at houses and going, I don't even want to live in that. That's not even as nice as the house I'm going to have when my house is done, baby, because we're working on that puppy. And I just started feeling discontent and disgruntled and like just upset about it. I was not happy. I was feeling like I'm, I'm not going to be happy with what I'm going to get when I move. And it, it really was eating me up. And so I'd look some more and I'd be just more and more bummed about it and talking to him and then we'd be having some talks where I'm like going, we got to do better than this. I'm not going to be happy with this. I'm telling my husband this. Oh, the good old Holy Spirit came after me. <laughs> oh, did he give me some spankings? And it's like, you are greedy, child. You are greedy. Vanita, you need to lay this on the altar and allow me to make a plan for you. I will select your home. I will select your home. And he began to show me that my thoughts toward him aren't good and that I'm putting a pressure on my husband, a pressure on him that he never deserved. I, I know my husband. He would give me a palace if he could. That's the truth. He, if he got me a palace, I couldn't clean all those rooms. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be a good situation. But God started just ministering to me. He called it what it is. He said, you are greedy and you need to put this to death. And I could not handle on my own. I actually had to take steps. And I told my husband, I have to take all of this off. I can't look these houses up anymore. I can't have these apps anymore. I removed everything from my computer and on my phone. And for a good while, I didn't look at it until I felt that God was, you know, he was dealing with my heart and he was getting me in the right spot. Now, it does want to rise its ugly face. (laughs) It wants to. And so it's a constant putting it to death. And recognizing, my God has got me. He's got his own plan. And if it's for less, I want to praise the Lord the same I would as if it was more, right? I know how treacherous it is. And that it shows that the world is getting the best of me and I'm buying into it. I have to put it to death so that I can have a pure heart before the Lord. He has the right to do with our lives as he pleases. 
He has the right to let some have more. He has the right to have some have less. And most people in this world have far less than all of us. And that is truth. So the next thing is, after the first one, which was, put your greed in check. The next one is, remind yourself often that God is good. God is a good God. Every last blessing in our life has been given to us directly from the Lord. Every one of them. Your home your food, your cars, your job, everything that fills your home, the lifestyle, the health, it all comes from the goodness of his hand. And it's amazing. Covetousness says God isn't good. Do you know that? And it's so untrue. We are not self-earned, self-created individuals. We're blessed because God has been good to us. Psalm 31, 19 says, How abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all men on those who take refuge in, it, in him. In other words, the world looks on and they see how good your God is to you, and it magnifies his name. He is good to us. And because he's good to us, the next thing we need to do is express our gratitude to God. Every time we grumble, in essence, we say he's not good. And, and when, our conscience, when we are conscious that all, that all of our provision and all our blessings come from him, we naturally give thanks, right? When we're, when we're conscious of him, we're aware of it, we give him thanks. I mean, when we bow our heads before we eat a meal, it's to stop and say, you provided this. It's not just to say, thank you for my wife because she cooked a good meal and I do appreciate those prayers because I do get a few of them. <laughs> thank you, honey. <laughs> but it's because God has provided. That's why we pray those prayers, not just bless it to our body, but thank you because I'm eating this meal and enjoying it because of you. And the more conscious we are that the clothing on our back was from him and everything else, the more the gratitude should flow from us. Do you verbalize it? Do you express it in your prayers to him? Thank you. I'm grateful. I appreciate all you've done for me. Do you let others know? Do you share it with him how good he is to you from day to day? Give praise. Give thanks. Give him glory for what he's done in your life and let others hear it. It's good for, the, for people who don't know Christ to hear how the Lord takes care of us. And you know, I think it's so important that we foster this attitude of gratitude amongst ourselves and that when we're praying together in our groups, well, there should be more praises, right? There should be more thank you, Lords, in our prayer time. And I just want to like, encourage us all to really implement that in our group time, to stop and praise him and thank him. So then, from there, we want to make our plans prayerfully. We don't want to get ahead of the Lord and devise a plan without his guidance. If you do, you set yourself up for failure and a possible disaster. Even right this minute, everybody in here is probably planning something. There's something on your heart, something that must be done, something you want to do, something you feel you're supposed to do. Have you invited him to be Lord of it? Or are you the boss of your life? Submit your plans to him. You know, we, when we want to build a house or we want to add on to our house, we have to submit plans, don't we? We have to go to our city and say, this is, this is the layout of what I want to accomplish. And they have, they have individuals on staff who know what safe is, who know what's legally right. And they're the ones that go in and they look at your, your, your whole plan and um, they, they, that blueprint and they say, hey, uh, this is not going to be safe. You need to make this change and make this change. And until you do, I'm not going to put a stamp of approval on it. But as you make those adjustments and those changes, they put their stamp of approval and then you may go build, correct? And you have the sense that what you're going to build is solid and it's safe. They come and even inspect it. They want to make sure. Yes, they charge an exorbitant fee. <laughs> But all we have to do is pray and start bringing our plans before him. And we should do that before we launch out and do our plans. It's not too late. Even right now, if, you, if you're moving forward in a plan, invite him, involve him, seek his approval, seek his wisdom, seek his guidance. That's what he would have us to do because if we don't know, if we don't do that, we don't know how the future will, t will turn out. We have no promise of his blessings. And you know what? 
we're more than likely going to end up with less than the best for ourselves. So make plans prayerfully. And then rid yourself of pride. Check it before you wreck it. Are you the boss? Are you in control of your future? Is your life full of me, myself, and I? I got this done. I will accomplish it. I will succeed. And we're pushing and pushing ourselves to succeed in the world's eyes. The fool says such things in his heart. The world self-promotes. The world is always working on their agenda and promoting it and pushing it. And they have to bolster themselves up in order to feel like they can accomplish it. And that's the way companies work. It's build you up, pump yourself up. They train you how to do that because in all of that self-esteem, you're supposed to accomplish something. But, but ladies, we're children of God. We're not self-made people at all. We are to live in cooperation of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, our accomplishments and our successes are due to the power of God and the ability that he puts within us. I had a friend bless me with a compliment recently saying, um, you know, that my service to the Lord was a blessing. You know, and she said her things and I told her, it isn't me. God makes me look good. I know what I'm really like. God makes me look good. I don't have to self-promote and self-build myself up. I just walk with the Lord and then he just makes me look good and he blesses the, the work of my hands and he will do the same for you. It's a different way of living. So rid yourself of pride and selfish ambitions and self-centeredness, all of those things that fall short of Christ-likeness. And then rely on the Lord. Beware of relying on things that you have banked, your money or your investments an inheritance. Do you know that there are people right now waiting for their parents to die, die so they could finally get a hold of their money? I mean, that sounds so horrible, right? But it's true. They want that money and they can't wait until their parents die to get it. That is an ugly way to have a heart, don't you think? <laughs> How about lawsuits? Looking for a lawsuit to get that payoff. Maybe you feel someone owes you something and you've you're got that in your back pocket so that you can draw from that. Look, we got to live our lives. We, we need to invest and we need to have savings and all of those things. But to truly rely on it, to think that that's how you're going to get through your life or through your crisis, you're going to uh, utterly be miserable when it falls through. To rely on anything or anyone other than the Lord, then it becomes a God to you because it's the altar at which you are worshiping now. Then... Be a good steward. The man was blessed with excess. He had so much, yet he hoarded it all to himself. What will you do differently than this man when God blesses you with excess? How, how do we determine what to do with, with what we've been given? How do we? Well, as stewards or managers, we need to pray and ask the Lord what to do with what he's given us. Understand that everything that comes to your hand is his already. It's already given to you by the Lord. So we pray and say, Lord, how would you have us manage what you've given us? Guide us with the use of these blessings. It could be your home. It could be your money. It could be possessions that you have that, that he wants you to be a steward over. It could even be your food. Ultimately, we're to manage it wisely. And what's something that we might be called to do as a good steward? How about give? give. The man viewed all of his possessions as his, so he never even thought to bless anyone else. What about you? Do you give back? Do you look for the opportunity to help others in need? Have you been sharing your blessings? If not, why not? This is, needs to be a matter of prayer for every one of us as God gives to us we want to be a blessing to others. So I want to encourage you, make a plan for giving. You know, um, purposely set money aside, you know, and make a plan how you might give to be a blessing. First, we can give tithes, that 10%, and give it to the church to help support the work of God. Then we can, we can always give offerings as well. Um, it's neat to support what God is doing. It, it's something that he's calling us to.
but we might be on that support a missionary. Even a small sum as they receive it can, can add up to help them be able to eat and you know, supply their housing and all kinds of things. So maybe your families would work together to support a missionary. Um, how about giving to those who are just in need? They are broke, they are down and out. How about supplying something to them? Scripture says to us, meet urgent needs. Sometimes needs come to our ears, don't they? And when they do, stop and pray. Is this meant for me to help? Is this where you want me to step in? Sometimes he calls us to make a sacrifice. It isn't always that we have an excess, is it? It's like I will sacrifice myself and something I might want for the sake of someone else who has a greater need. That is giving. So make a plan. Pray about it. Be a giver. Um, Consider even giving away things that you have as excess. This is something, as I am going through my house and I'm having to look at what I own, um, you know, I've been able to sell a few things, but as I'm going m more and more toward that, my thought is, give away more things. Bless people who don't have them or never would be able to have them, you know? Rather than going, oh, I need to make a buck off of it, how about just helping somebody who would never be blessed with that? on their own. And so I'm just, I just have a real heart to be more giving and be more generous that way. So consider giving away rather than selling for gain. First Timothy 6, 18 and 19, let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, speaking of eternity, that they may lay hold on eternal life. That is the heart God has for us. And then serve. Serving others turns our selfishness right side up. It's because we care for others and we're, we're not self-centered, but other-centered. So use your energies, your talents, your abilities, your mind, your education, your possessions to help someone else. What can you do for your neighbor down the street? Do you know anybody that you could just bless in some way, that you could serve? Maybe the little old lady across the street could have her lawn mowed, you know, or her weeds pulled, something like that. Maybe your neighbors, um, you know, maybe you want to, you've got, you've baked something and you have extra, my mom used to do this all the time. She would make a pot of soup and then she'd feed the neighborhood. It was so cute. They all look forward to her soup and her, you know, um, uh, what do you call them? You know, I, I rarely eat sweets anymore, so it's so hard to remember the names of cupcakes. Cupcakes, that's it. <laughs> so far from me now. <laughs> she'd bake cupcakes and, you know, she'd keep her few, but then really, truthfully, she'd just give them out to everybody. And it was just beautiful to see my mom do that. So what could you do for your neighbors? How could you bless them? What about your community? We want to display God's works in a way that, that shows them he's real. Do something to bless your community. Get involved. What about your church? Bless them. Serve in your church. Serve. Find a way to serve people. Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially to those who are the household of God. We're getting to the end. We're almost there. Put off worldly lusts. He said, eat, drink, and be merry. I'm going to take pleasure. It's five o'clock somewhere. You know, he had that, he had that attitude. Are you self-indulgent? Are you still living kind of a party life and a party atmosphere? Living in that worldly experience, it's, it's so popular today. You're nobody unless you're doing it kind of attitude. Drunkenness, drug use, hookups, seductiveness, profanity, impure thoughts, sensual living. These are wasteful in God's economy. He's calling us to holiness and to be set apart. We are told very sharply in scripture, put them off. When Jesus purchased your lives, ladies, he did it with a high purpose in mind for you. It's a high order of calling to make you beautiful, to shine through you inside first and then out with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Does that sound like what the world is living? Very different. This is precious in the sight of God. Remember whose daughter you are and conduct yourself 
in a holy fashion. 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And here's the last one. Be eternally minded. Be eternally minded. The Bible says that we're pilgrims here, that we're just passing through. We are citizens of heaven, and heaven is our actual uh, home. So we should live with a light touch here on this earth. And so uh, are you living with a light touch on this earth, or are you accumulating and amassing more and more for yourself? Are you, are you living with the idea that I'm here and I want to make the best of it? this? Are you living with the idea I'm going to heaven so I want to live for God's glory? Ask yourself, how will I spend my life pleasing the Lord? What must I do to please his heart? What am I doing that brings heavenly reward? Or will what I'm doing be burnt as a fire and wasted in the end? Ask the Lord about your priorities that they would match his priorities for you. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish like the rich fool, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Many say, life is short, make it count. But I want to say to you, life is short, make it count for heaven. Let's pray. Father, with all the tremendous blessings that you give us, our food and our clothing and our homes and our cars and just the possessions we have and then the blessings within our families, our jobs, everything, Lord. We just, how do we say thank you? It's just, those words seem so shallow, but we do. We do thank you for taking care of us. Your oversight over our life is beautiful. It's so detailed. It's so generous, Lord. We thank you. Father, we struggle with covetousness. We struggle with greed. We struggle with wanting more and better and the latest and the nicest. We struggle. We compete, Lord. We want to be equal with people that are, you know, that are beyond us in these things. And we don't want to live this way. We want to live a, a life that is unstained. And we want to live a life that's looking heavenward rather than in this temporal flesh. So would you do a work in us, Lord? Would you let these truths speak to us and wash us clean again? Wash our mind of greed. Wash our attitude of it, Lord. We pray you'd set our desires under your Holy Spirit, that we would give ourselves to your Holy Spirit and cooperate with you, and we, we would put our greed in check so that you can get more honor out of our life. Show us how to live this and be profitable to you and to the world around us. And so I pray that by your Spirit, you'd speak very personally to every one of us in this room and that we would move forward, Lord, in a way that just um, really puts a smile on your face. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. All right, ladies, enjoy your group time.